Good evening. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our sins, heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from the pit and crowns us with love and compassion, who satisfies our desires with good things so that our, our youth is renewed like eagles. Let's stand this evening and sing in praise for our Redeemer. Good evening, folks. Go ahead and have a seat. I want to welcome you here on a Maundy Thursday as we commemorate and celebrate the Last Supper. And so uh, as we make our way through Holy Week, this is one of those uh, seminal events then in which the, the Lord instituted what we continue to celebrate in Holy Communion, at, at, at remembering his death and resurrection through those uh, elements of bread and wine or grape juice. And so we are so uh, grateful uh, to be able to gather this night and to celebrate that. Uh, this evening I'm going to be uh, uh, hosting, as the host uh, of the Last Supper, the person who uh, had the house where they came to in order to give us that narration of, of the events of the evening and to draw us into a participation in the Last Supper as uh, people who have entered into that space. And with a, a little bit of holy imagination, we get to kind of be there. And so uh, tomorrow night, I'll mention that uh, I'm going to be portraying uh, one of the figures from the crucifixion who would not be on the popularity list, but one of the guards, uh, in fact, the, one of the ones who beat the life out of Jesus before he was taken away to be crucified. And so we're going to have a testimonial from someone who was there 
but not as one of his followers uh, who will tell us about the crucifixion tomorrow evening. So tomorrow evening's portrayal will not be nearly as friendly a fellow as this evening's, just so you have that awareness coming into it uh, in thinking about tomorrow evening. And we're also going to have some responsive kind of um, actions that you can uh, partake in tomorrow evening, some different uh, things that are kind of hands-on experiences than which you can uh, uh, respond and enter into the remembrance of Jesus' crucifixion uh, tomorrow evening. Well, as we begin this evening, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and share together in a word of prayer. Almighty God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ, our Lord, for the saving work of Jesus Christ that is testified to through Holy Communion in his broken body and his blood that is spilt. All of this for our salvation, to restore us from the brokenness of sin, to cleanse us from its guilt and shame and even of its penalty, and so that we could be forgiven, cleansed, and set free. And with uh, your resurrection, we know that we gain the promise of everlasting life that begins right now with the renewing power, O oh God, of your grace. In all of this, Lord, we are blessed beyond compare and blessed beyond any deserving that we possess. And so we come with humility tonight to gather around the table, to remember the suffering of our Savior, and to seek his face, to worship him who has loved us so much that he gave his life for us. So we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would just descend upon us and uh, move in our hearts this evening as we hear the scripture, as we, as we are drawn into its life and meaning, and as we partake in Holy Communion. Let your presence, Lord, be known. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. I'm going to invite Bill Dietz to come on up. He's going to read a couple of scriptures for us this evening that uh, put us in the, the, the events of this night. So if Roy not walks toward you with a Bible and a mic, you know what's going to happen. I'm going to read from Luke 22, starting in verse 8. It says, where do you want us to prepare for, the, uh, prepare for it, they ask. And he replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to his house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, all furnished, make, prepa uh, make pre preparations there. They left and found the things just as Jesus had told him. So they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, Jesus and his, his disciples reclined at a table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover. I will not eat again until the, uh, I find f f fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, the cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And then in verse 39, he goes on. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On the, upon reaching the place, he asked them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He, would, he withdrew about a stone's throw away from them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And he, he being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. 
When he rose from prayer, he went back to the disciples and found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and a man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when Jesus' followers saw what was going, on, going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Please stand with me as he will.
Ah, welcome. Welcome, my dear friends. I am so delighted to welcome you here into my home, and I call you friends, not merely as a charitable welcome, but I welcome you as friends, for you have presented yourselves as followers of Jesus, and so you are my friends. And I am so delighted to have you here in my home on this special evening. <laughs> but this is not the first time that I have been host to a very special evening. And that is why you are here. Because you know that I was host to the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples. Yes, it was here in my home. I was privileged, honored beyond measure to have the Master come to my home. Oh, you may wonder why I was chosen. I cannot answer. You may wonder how I was ready for him. Had he sent word ahead? Did I have his reservations? <laughs> no. No, not at all. Unless, unless we look to the Holy Spirit as the one who would make reservations for a divine appointment. Oh, even the days long before this evening came, I had come to know Jesus. He touched so many people's lives. Lepers who had their rotting flesh restored. And with it, their lives, their families. <sighs> Blind men. Born in the dark. Never seeing light. Not even their mother's face. And then Jesus opened their eyes. Others afflicted with disease and brokenness that had robbed them of so much. And others who are under the attack of our enemy, demonically destroyed in their lives, possessed in his power, and yet set free by the King of glory. Oh, I was one of those touched. Touched by Jesus. He gave life to me. And I would have given anything to serve him. I followed after him for a time, but the life that he had given to me meant that I, I was needed to my family's care, and, and so I settled once again here in Jerusalem. Oh, but how I looked forward to seeing him on any occasion that presented itself, any opportunity to hear him, to just be near him. Sometimes I traveled to gain that chance other times, when he was in Jerusalem, I had those moments in which I could sit at his feet amongst the crowds. <sighs> the Master continues to touch so many. And as this Passover season approached, Jerusalem was a stir. Jerusalem was a stir with all kinds of rumors and fears, always during the great high holy days when crowds came from all over the country, from towns and and from the countryside all about, and filled the city. It was a tense time. 
Despite the joy of the celebration, it was tense. For the Romans were always at hand and always watching over us. Always there to pounce upon anyone who seemed to violate their laws or failed to pay their taxes. And this, this season was no different unless it was even more heightened in the fear and the concern over what was going to happen. Jesus was gathering crowds himself and just a short while ago, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. <laughs> this drew attention of so many as people came to see the one that had died and now was alive because of Jesus' command. They came listening to Lazarus' story and so many were then turned toward Jesus. Rumors began to stir, and then public outcries. Clashes between the religious leaders and Jesus had been something that had happened over and over again, but now, now there was something different in the air. They had made actual announcements that if anyone should see Jesus during this holy season, that they should contact them, that they needed to report him, that they wanted to arrest him. Yes, in the days that grew closer and closer to the Passover, tensions were rising and when Jesus entered into the city with fanfare, well, the religious leaders were in an uproar. It was obvious that they were not at all going to sit back and wait upon things. They, they were becoming more aggressive. And this was raising many concerns for those of us who loved him and who had recognized that he was God's Messiah. Many were wondering if he would come. For though he had entered into the city, he then disappeared. Some said he was out in the countryside. And there were many wondering if he would even come into the city again during this time with so many threats in the air. But somehow in those days, I found myself with a rising desire to prepare. To prepare for the Passover. And, and, and we did not have family and friends who were planning to come and to fill our home, and so there was no reason to make grand preparations, nothing out of the ordinary. But I found myself urgently desiring to arrange, to prepare, to clean the house, to, to make all things in readiness. <laughs> you can imagine when the knock came at the door. When I heard the call of my servant, that there were two men here to see me who were looking for a room. <laughs> and when I saw that it was Peter and John, <laughs> Jesus had sent them. He had sent them to my house. Well, not directly. He, he, he told them that they should follow a man carrying a water jug and go to his home and there ask the owner of the house if there was a room. 
a room for him to celebrate Passover with his disciples. <laughs> he sent them to follow a man carrying a water jug. And that was my servant. He was carrying a water jug. This was not even his ordinary job. And yet Jesus sent them to follow him <laughs> and to come to my house. <laughs> of course. I said, yes. <laughs> All is in readiness. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, the master may come. I would be delighted to receive him. In that evening as they gathered into my house, I listened. Not as a diner at the table, but as their servant. And I listened as the master spoke. And he spoke to them in ways that were, were not happy and joyous, were not filled with a, a hope and excitement, not even in that recollection of the, of the Passover and of God's deliverance. There was something deep and somber in him. I could tell that all were concerned, and I thought perhaps it's, it's these tensions that are there in the air with threats and, 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 and calls for his arrest and these clashes with the religious leaders that keep telling him that he's wrong and, that, and telling the people to stay away from him, to not be deceived by his miracles. And certainly it was. And I began to understand as he was speaking to the disciples that, that as he spoke and in these strange, mysterious ways, he, he was talking to them not just about the fear of an arrest or, or, of, or of the anger of the religious leaders. But he was speaking of something different. Something more that was to come of what he was about to do. And, and it was so confusing in that moment as I listened to him say that one of them would betray him, and all of them were fearful and worried that it might be them, and asked if it was, and declared that it was not, and, and pointed to each other and said, maybe that one, and, and they nearly broke out into an argument as they each one tried to prove that they were his best follower, that he could rely on them without fail. Peter, always ready with a strong, quick response, declared that he would die for him. And Jesus told him that tonight you'll tell people three times over, you don't even know who I am. This, this is unbelievable. And Peter didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. I couldn't understand how any of them could betray him. And then, in the midst of the meal, he, he served up portions with strange promises and mysterious descriptions. He lifted up bread and breaking it said, this is my body broken for you.
his body. Broken. If you could try to rationalize that in your mind, listening to this, that he's, he's, just, he's just saying that, that he would be given to all. A peace for everyone. Enough of him to go around. <laughs> but then when he raised up the cup, said, this is my blood. There was no way to understand this, no way to explain it. What could he be telling his disciples about his body and his blood? It had such foreboding that it, that it made your heart sink with, with, with the sense of, of doom and dismay. I tell you that ever since that night, I can, I can scarcely break a piece of bread at the dinner table without thinking of him without being taken back to that moment again and all of the fear and, and confusion of his body, his blood. But he told them, take this, eat this, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. Oh, but we would have to see so much more before we could truly remember all of this. There would have to be the next day when his body would be broken and his blood would be shed. There would have to be the next day in the haunting, waiting in darkness, fear, hiding, hopeless. And there would have to be another day a day when he would come to life. And suddenly, his brokenness became life. His blood became healing and forgiveness. So, I am glad to welcome you this night as we would gather again to break bread and drink from his cup. I am so grateful as well to he invited me to that evening. Not as one of those who sat at the table, but one of those simply blessed to serve him. And so I would say this to you. This would be my encouragement forever, is always be listening for that moving of God's Spirit. When he might move in you to do something that seems so strange or pointless and yet so compelling is his presence that you must not ignore it, but let him lead. And when he knocks at your door and clearly his call is there to open, then open wide. Open wide your heart to him and open wide your life that you might serve him. For when he calls and knocks and you open your life to him, 
<laughs> you have no idea what joy is in store. What goodness is to be wrought. But you will not want to miss his divine appointment for your life. Let us bow and let us pray. Almighty God, you are holy and good. Your grace is overwhelming, abundant and full, and we are so grateful. Because God, you have not invited just the, the wealthy, the wise, the privileged, and the powerful but you have invited all of us to come to your table. And you continue to make this invitation to us. Come to the table. Come and receive you. Come and be nourished in our souls with a salvation that would change our lives. That you would continue to knock upon our doors and call us to open. So Lord, I would pray that as we gather at this table tonight, that we would be ready to hear from your spirit. In fact, that we would long after you. And that we would be ever watchful that you might move us in a direction that we did not see coming. And that we would have openings occur in our life that we might have tried to keep shut. But Lord, help us tonight to be in a place with you where we can open wide our hearts to say, yes, Lord Jesus, come in. And yes, Lord Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready to serve you. So bless this communion, we ask, just as Jesus blessed it that night. Let it be blessed to us, O oh God, as a meal of fellowship with you in the presence of your Spirit. And let it bind us to you, O God, as people who know that we are receiving our daily bread and it is Jesus, that we are washed clean and it is Jesus. So, Lord, we come. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to come this evening. And we have 12 seats for the disciples the seat draped with the purple cloth is in remembrance of Jesus, and so that's his seat. In fact, my guess about some of the seating at the table is that in the biblical times, a U-shaped configuration was, was common, and that the host, the leading figure at the table would be seated there. The right-hand man, well, there is that person that they would turn to if they wished something, needed something, someone that would be there who is personal and uh, connected to them and ready at hand. Next to him, a special guest, someone that as they didn't sit in chairs but leaned on pillows on the floor on their left arm, they would then turn to the table with their right hand to eat and uh, this is likely where Judas sat and shared the dish with Jesus. The one other person that I'm guessing at, but I'm, I have this guess that Peter sat over here at this point, that it was from there he was able to reach out to John, who we think is the one who is leaning against Jesus, which is if you're all lined up, it's very easy to just lean back and be against Jesus' breast. John at his right hand, Peter, over here we'd readily be able to signal to John, ask him who he means when he says someone's going to betray him. The rest of the disciples, I have no idea. Those are just my guesses of where they get to sit. So you might find yourself in a seat and be thinking of one of the disciples in particular or or just simply there as now a disciple, a follower of Jesus, who gets to come to the table now and gather with Jesus as he breaks the bread. So we'll avoid the seat with the purple cloths and take up the 12 seats around the table.
Don't pull them in, push them out. Just let them sit. You can walk between the table and the chairs. You can sit down in them on the edge of your seat. You should be able to reach the table and share the elements as uh, you come to the table. So this evening, uh, Bill's standing back there at the ready. I think he'll help you a little bit maybe in counting you out to get you up here. And um, we'll invite you to come to the table. And so... The bread is in the baskets. If you need gluten-free bread, these little bowls have little gluten-free wafers in them. I'm going to invite you to pass the baskets, to share with each other. There are baskets at each table. And so uh, please take the bread. Jesus gave the bread to his disciples and said, this is my body that's broken for you. So he said, take it, eat it, in remembrance of me. You can share the cup if you need to help each other or uh, a little bit, please feel free to shift the trays along or hand a cup to each other. At the end of the meal, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, giving thanks, and said, take and drink. For this is the blood of a new covenant, my blood shed for, for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink, all of you, from it. set your cups in the back rows on your on the board if you like and uh, almighty god let your blessing rest upon these who come that as they go they would go in your grace be renewed in your strength and walk after your way through jesus christ our lord amen Please go ahead and take the bread and help each other as you pass the baskets. Jesus broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you.
take the cup. Jesus lifted the cup, giving thanks. He blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This is my blood. The blood of a new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Take it and drink it now in remembrance of Christ. For your blessing, O oh God, we are thankful. For your saving grace, O oh God, we are beyond grateful. We surrender our lives to you, and so, Lord, I pray that those who have come would go now as your disciples, filled with grace, blessed, oh God, to walk in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. room for a couple more? Take the bread. Share it with one another. Jesus broke the bread, passed it to his disciples, said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of Christ. Would you take the cup? Jesus lifted up the cup and blessed it as he gave thanks and said, Take and drink. This is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this now in remembrance of Christ. Lord, we are grateful to you for your mercies that have reached us, that you have reached into this world and sacrificially bought our salvation. Now, Lord, as we receive this gift of your grace, let each one then go refreshed, renewed, and empowered to walk in your way. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Take the bread, share it with one another.
Jesus shared the bread with them, that strained declaration, this is my body broken for you. Take it, eat it, in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. Take the cup. You'll be disappointed in your friend. Jesus, at the end of the meal, lifted the cup, gave thanks, said, take and drink, all of you, this is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Lord, by your mighty power, you have delivered us. A mighty power that is exerted through sacrifice. And we, God, give you glory and worship the Savior who laid down his life for us. Thank you, O God, for your mercy. We pray now, Lord, that as we receive your grace in faith, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, strengthen those that as they go, that they might go in the power of your grace, renewed and refreshed by your love, and ready to walk in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the bread, share it with each other. Jesus broke the bread, gave it to his disciples. Broke it, said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. Take the cup. Jesus lifted the cup and gave thanks, passed it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink, all of you. For this is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink now in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. Our Lord Jesus, we worship and praise you for your sacrificial love. You said to the disciples in the upper room that there is no greater love that anyone has than this, but that you would lay down your life for your friends. And he called them, and you call us your friends. Thank you, O oh God, for such mercy. Pray that those who have come would receive your grace, be blessed with the forgiveness of sin, the newness of life, and go forth in the power of Christ to follow after his way as disciples of Jesus. Amen.
small world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just take the breath. Share it with one another that each one has. Jesus broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. Please take the cup. Jesus gave thanks, blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, drink all of you from it. This is my blood that is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. We thank you, Lord, for the invitation to sit at your table to share in this meal with you. We remember that who you are, you're our Savior, the one who died for us, broken, bloodied, to make us whole, to heal us, to wash us, to make us right, clean, justified. All of those precious words, God. So we thank you. We pray, God, that as we have come to entrust our lives to you, to give thanks to you and to worship you, that we would go in the power of your Holy Spirit, refreshed and renewed in your grace, and ready to walk after your way. In the power of Jesus' name, amen. Kind of a fresh experience to sit around the table with communion like this. Uh, every year I kind of look forward to these kinds of moments. I always find it touching whenever we end up having to take the elements in hand and share them with each other, pass them around at the table. We get so used to maybe kind of a sanitized religious experience of just you walk up, you get your peace, you go do your thing, and we're done. I always find it particularly touching watching people have to pass the plate along and share those things, and sometimes they're looking out for each other. They say, oh, you can't reach that. Let me help you. There's something really wonderful about that. puts us in touch with the fact that we are brought together around the table to not only worship the Lord and to be in his presence, but to, do, but to share that table together, to share that, that love of Jesus and his grace together as his body in this world. And we, we just need to be always conscious and grateful of that. And uh, so it's uh, been a blessing and a joy for me to kind of take this journey as well, stepping into the shoes of the man who hosted. You notice I didn't give you a name because we don't have a name in the Bible for this guy. We don't really know what his connection was to Jesus. But they didn't send John and Peter saying, make sure you take money uh, to pay the rent. Uh, he didn't say, go down the road to this guy. I set something up uh, last week so that we would have a place. He just sent them in that odd manner 
to a person's house where when they ask, hey, where is the place for the Lord? And in fact, in the Gospel of Mark, it kind of phrase, it seems to phrase it, Jesus, them asking uh, that Jesus says, where is my guest room? Uh, like, where's a place for me? And uh, so why does a person respond? Why does a person act in opening their home that way? That's why I speculate that this is a person that did have some connection with Jesus, was touched by Jesus somehow along the way, uh, but was not a person who was called out by name. They, they might very well have gone to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home. They had been there uh, days before uh, for a banquet. They could have gone there for the Passover. Why not go there for the Passover? But this put them in an out-of-the-way place, not one of the obvious points. If you're looking for Jesus, go look over there, because obviously that's somebody that he would go to. Uh, it put them in, a, in that sort of context where they had a relative privacy and safety in it. We assume, at least I do, that they probably went back to this room after the crucifixion, that this was probably the house that they ended up in when Jesus was resurrected, given that it was the house that they had last been with him in. And if that's the case, then again, it reinforces the idea that it was somebody that was ready as a follower of Jesus to give them a safe haven in those days when things were tense. Even the fact that the door was opened in the first place had to overcome the, pu the, the public pursuit of Jesus I had uh, forgotten until I was reading through it all again that John mentions that the priests and the Pharisees had been putting the word out that they wanted to arrest Jesus, report him, please. And so we now understand why Judas would have thought, oh, I could go do that. It all comes together in a way, though, that suggests that the message that was shared tonight the Lord orchestrates all kinds of interesting things in our life. Many things we don't see coming. And that even when the Lord is mo moving and motivating us along, sometimes it's like, I don't understand why I need to do this. Like when God wakes you up thinking of someone in the middle of the night, or you find yourself in the middle of the day feeling like, I need to pray for this person. Or, hmm, maybe I need to give them a call. And you have no idea why you would need to do that until you act on it. And God many times reveals that he had something scheduled as an appointment for you and me. So we need to act on that as well. And that's an encouragement I'll send you out with tonight as well. That as we sing our last song, let's open up our hearts to the Lord, to trust him who is savior, to schedule his divine appointments in our life, and to be ready to follow after him, faithful, obedient, open, and ready to receive from him. Let's rise up together and sing once more.
Janice got to solo a little bit tonight. Uh, you had a couple verses we didn't, so that was fine. Uh, I remind you that after the dinner, Jesus, as we read in the scripture, went out to the Mount of Olives, out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and went out there to spend time in prayer, which became very intense. And then those who were seeking after him came, arrested him. He spent the rest of the night in trials and hearings and being prodded and confronted by Pilate and Herod and back to Pilate again, uh, as well as the, the religious leaders who had begun the night with uh, their examination and their trial and hearings uh, of him. Uh, in the end, he's through, through the night battered and exhausted and condemned so that tomorrow will be that Friday of his uh, death. And um, I urge you tonight then that as you go home, spend a little bit of time in prayer. Take a little time perhaps uh, even to read some of the scriptures from this night. You can find this evening in Luke 22, as we heard earlier. I'd also remind you that uh, over the weekend, beginning tomorrow night after service, we just uh, will have the, the uh, chapel open for prayer and uh, all the way up through midnight. And, um, and then again, Saturday, 6 a.m. through midnight to have a vigil of prayer. I'd like to invite you to sign up for a spot. You don't have to come to the church to fulfill your time pr uh, prayer, uh, but it'll be open to you. But I would uh, love to have that filled out and see that we have par partnered up to pray through uh, that time from Jesus' crucifixion, the remembrance tomorrow evening in the, in the uh, service, and then all the way through then till uh, Saturday evening. Uh, so you can sign up out on the welcome area in the middle. Don't forget, too, that tomorrow there are crosswalks in both Oil City and Franklin. Uh, Oil City begins at, uh, I think, 1030, I think. 1030? Yeah, and the one here in Franklin begins at 10. And uh, also the layman's breakfast is tomorrow morning at uh, 6 a.m. over at the K uh, KFC uh uh, hall and uh, service following that, seven at uh, Grace in Oil City, um, so that if you, uh, if you wanted to head out to those uh, tomorrow, all kinds of events where you can join with others in celebrating Christ. Let me send you with a simple blessing then. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. Amen.